Good afternoon. I'm very happy to welcome you to our forum. I, I'm sorry that we don't have so many people, but people should feel pity because everything which is being discussed there is being solved here. So all the questions connected with education and which next generations we are to expect. This is the key issue for the development of any area of the humanity. In this respect, we'd like to have a discussion and elaborate on traditional issues in education and due to the coronavirus pandemic we are living right now, I'd like our speakers to discuss the questions not only connected with the training of further generations, but on with the issues of how the tools and methods of this training are changing, how the digital tools and digital technologies are going to be involved in the education process and training. I'd like to ask speakers to elaborate on how the quality of education is going to be like with the new normal. Our speakers, first of all, I'd like to introduce great speakers who are present here on this stage. This is Aksana Kasachenko, the president of Sistema Charitable Foundation, which has been working in education for a long time in different areas of education, different stages of education and training. It will be very interesting to listen to your opinion. And I'd like to introduce uh, Marina Lvova, Director of Educational Programs at Desault Systems in Russia, and CS. Marina worked in Siemens' representative office for a long period of time. And as far as I understand, uh, within her current company, they are discussing the academic development, which is very important from the perspective of not general education development, but the education which is really required. The education which caters to demands of the big businesses. Among the online speakers, I'd like to introduce Zinkovic, Mr. Zinkovic, the Vice President of Development of Prasvishenia Education Holding. If you know, he was the member of the present administration till 2017, or the last period of time, he has been the uh, first deputy of the Minister of Education, and when the government was changed, he started his job uh, in professional education holding. Also, we're going to have Ms. Benedict Duran, Vice President of Academic Affairs of the Sian Spore, uh, on education. She's going to share her experience of how they m had to transform their education system from offline to online. Also, we're going to have Alexander Bundakov, the member of uh, the Russian Academy of Education, Director General of Mobile um, Electronic Education in Russia, the person who has experience as an official. He was the Deputy Minister of Education of Russia. He was uh, the head of Prosvishenia Holding Company, Trofa Holding Company. All his credentials, a background, uh, you know that he is from great family. His parent was the Deputy Head of the University in USSR, who is very famous for his research in education. Probably we are going to have a Bright Think uh, Academy, a great uh, Britain, uh, Robert Mitten, and uh, Vice President of the Confederation of Industry of the Czech Republic, Radek Spitzer. I'd like to start our discussion with the uh, interview, which was given by Jeff Majokanda, the chief executive officer of the probably most famous online project, Coursera. The interview is, he's interviewed by the Marina Petrova, who is the director of MGIMO Endowment Fund. Please uh, look at the screen and listen to the interview. 
there, Marina, as Jeff Majin called her from Coursera. Hi, it's so nice to meet you. I'm Marina from Moscow University for International Relations. Nice to meet you. Jeff, every business dreams about scaling, and uh, uh, I can say that uh, that's what Coursera did during this coronavirus blackout. It was uh, 28 million learning uh, hours that uh, Coursera provided for all over the world, and I want to also to say thank you from all the academic community for you to make these courses free. Uh, so, how did you manage to uh, scale in uh, such a big scale, and uh, how did you manage to maintain the high quality of the courses? It has really been a, an incredible whirlwind since February. I mean, obviously, Coursera has been around for eight years. It was started by two Stanford faculty who wanted to make world-class learning available to everybody in the world. We had, even before COVID, tens of millions, uh, like, I don't know, 50 million or so learners on the site. So we already had pretty good servers and a pretty scalable uh, infrastructure. But when COVID hit, we saw, according to UNESCO, 1.6 billion students from kindergarten through college had their schools closed. The first thing that we did is we said, there's going to be an issue and we need to provide better service, free service to anybody who's been impacted, any school or student who's been impacted. So we launched a free version of Coursera for Campus in March. So since mid-March, more than 19 million new students have come and joined Coursera. 500,000 learners in Russia have joined since mid-March. That's up 270% since last year. The key to this, I think, Fundamentally, it's having good infrastructure is up and running. And we have a, a very talented team. We've been doing that for quite some time. It's having a team that trusts each other, that is obviously smart and well-informed and has very clear goals. So I mean, we have about 650 people at Coursera now. We have to be able to communicate really well with the entire company so that everybody is aligned and marching in the new direction. You also launched uh, some master's degree programs and bachelor's de degree programs. So you compete with the uh, universities uh, in uh, their traditional form. And uh, so what is your advantage uh, in this competition? I want to point out that all of the courses on Coursera are authored by universities. And there's some from industry partners, but, but we have 165 university partners including eight universities in Russia, who have created these courses on Coursera. So we think of ourselves more as a partner to universities than a competitor to universities. So one of our most recent degrees that we just launched with the National Research University of Higher School of Economics, HSE, uh, in, in Russia, is a master's degree in data science. So it's a degree that's on Coursera. It's 100% online. But you have to go through the admissions process with HSE. You get taught by professors live. You get your grades come from HSE. And then when you graduate, you get a diploma and you graduate from higher school of economics with a master's degree in data science. So Coursera is really just a delivery system for the online degrees from our university partners. So a lot of universities are really looking to expand the population of learners that they can reach on a global basis all around the world as well. So reach is the number one thing that university partners are looking to Coursera. Another a big uh, advantage is obviously you can reach a population who doesn't want to quit work. So the average age of a, of a uh, degree student on Coursera is about 45 years old. So much older than the typical on-campus degree student and using Coursera and doing this online makes it affordable and uh, convenient for a whole new population of learners to get their degree online. Uh, yes, it's absolutely clear with all the advantages of uh, Coursera and online education in general, but uh, there are also some challenges. Not global communication is also very important. Uh, so as well as the soft skills that they get uh, in uh, their uh, negotiation skills and uh, presentation uh, skills. Uh, so, uh, how can we reach all this in um, online education? 
When we do online degrees, we integrate Zoom. So you actually do talk directly with your professors. You talk with your TAs. You do group projects and talk live with your other colleagues. One of the really neat things about doing a degree on Coursera is your classmates come from all around the world, from every industry. You might have someone in marketing who works in Europe and somebody else who's a te technologist who lives in Colombia. And you're working on a project together and you can really share your professional experience and your industry experience, your job role experience as you're doing that. And I do think that companies are really looking for those soft skills development and social learning is a big part of how to develop those soft skills. The most important thing that I think professors can do when they think about delivering screen-based uh, lectures is to break up the lectures into smaller chunks where they can have maybe 10 or 15 minutes of live synchronous lectures. And then you break it up with 10 or 15 minutes of self-paced asynchronous working and maybe conversation with, um, with the classmates. And one of the most important things is bite-sized videos and assessments and projects that kind of mixes it up as opposed to one long online Zoom video. Are there any security risks for people who use Coursera to uh, use it and uh, leave some personal information in, uh, in uh, your website? Yeah, the, um, there, of course there are risks anytime you're on the internet and the incidence of um, cyber attacks and the need for cybersecurity continues to be very high and, and growing, frankly. There's many really good um, architectures and software strategies to create highly secure uh, uh, it's, it's platforms and, and delivery models. One of the most important things about Coursera is that we work with the largest universities and companies in the world. And so all of our universities audit Coursera to make sure that we have all the appropriate security provisions in place. And on the privacy, you know, we don't do any advertising and we make the data available to the university if it's the university students and we never sell the data to anybody. So, so we do take all the precautions that are necessary. And um, as far as I know, in eight years, we've never had a security or privacy breach at Coursera. Tell us what uh, your new project that you are working in now, maybe uh, after the uh, coronavirus, what is your next uh, um, top? MOOCs were started in 2012 uh, with Coursera and Udacity and edX and a few others. And that first wave was really about lecture videos. So that's our current major next thing is hands-on projects. And then I can see a wave three coming, which is really more about social learning. I think role play simulations will be a really big part of this. Group and collaborative projects will be a really big part of this. And VR and the sense of presence, virtual presence with others will likely be a big part of this as well. And what will come I think next is probably gonna be very effective soft skills learning environments using social learning. How do you see the education in 20 or 30 years, both online and offline education, or they are all together? You know, I graduated from college about 30 years ago, and I'm really struck. The domain of things that you're expected to know and to learn is considerably higher than what it was when I graduated from college. Not only do you need to know, you know, reading and writing and arithmetic and humanities, and ideally, you'll also have some global fluency about how cultures around the world interact. So there's a lot more that people need to learn now than they did before. And then I'll do 30, but 30 is a lot harder. I think in the next three years, clearly, we're going to see many more blended classrooms. So you'll have classrooms where some people are online and some people are on campus in the, in the classroom. And the people on campus might then go online and people online might come to campus. So you'll be a, a much bigger blend of online and in person. Uh, and so with online learning, you can deliver good learning experiences at lower cost. I think that there will be a reduction in the cost of online learning and the cost of earning a degree. The final one is that this is going to be something that you do not just for four years when you're at college. Lifelong learning, learning on the entire time that you're at work and, and online because you're going to be working is going to be a, another big feature of the next three years or so. So 
I think that the next 30 years will accelerate much faster than they ever have before. And technology will be incredibly important. We really think at Coursera that, that learning is the source of human progress. It's the most important thing that humanity needs to do because it will give us hope to shape the world in a way that will be a place that we all want to live in in the future. Yes, wow, that's very inspiring. I'm also interested about how do you see the role of business in uh, the education? What would you uh, advise to companies? Uh, as I know, you um, uh, have a lot of corporate courses as well. well. I would say that businesses, well, all institutions play a very important role in the education of individuals. And not only higher education institutions, but businesses and governments as well, which is why we have Coursera for Business, Coursera for Government, and Coursera for Campus. All three of those institutions are incredibly important, especially for businesses in a world where confidence, individual confidence in other human institutions is really dropping. Often the most confidence is in businesses. So I think businesses can certainly be educators who provide good education to individuals. I also think that businesses should lead in the transformation of society to create a more just and equitable world. And so I think the responsibility of businesses is playing a larger and larger role uh, in the landscape of all countries around the world. Thank you very much for uh, such an inspiring speech. Rita, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure chatting with you and uh, look forward to, to working with you and your institution uh, in the years ahead. Thank you, Jeff, goodbye. You know, after such a very interesting interview with the CEO of Coursera, the success of which are amazing. They have 29 million of students, the cooperation with the leading higher schools of the US, Great Britain, Russia. Getting down to our mundane situation, we need to think and start our discussion of how the capabilities of new technologies and at what stage of education they are going to be implemented in Russia and how it is going to be required on the labor market. I'd like to give the floor to uh, Aksana. From my perspective, FK uh, system uh, has uh, created a end-to-end uh, -end system to prepare and train specialists and we are very interested in your perspective and in your idea of these forthcoming changes to the education system. Thank you very much for giving the floor. Hello to everyone. Thanks to all those present here. You know, everything surrounding us is based on education. I have a presentation, but I'm going to speak about different things. How can I use this remote control? That's absolutely true. AFK system company has been dealing with education project for 15 years until uh, summer 2020 it has been in place in the in, in the format in the offline format we've been dealing with education of uh, children uh, from 12 to 18 years old we've been trained to train them technological skills not trained to replace the schools but to complement the schools and the deeper we worked the more often we heard that the access to the information was possible that's why my actual presentation is called whether it is worth um, training and educating people when we have Wikipedia, for example. As an education initiative, which we call Lift to the Future or Elevated to the Future, why do we call it like that? In fact, starting from school bench, we wanted to tell teenagers and youngsters of which professions and occupations do exist, what they can give, where uh, you can get necessary skills for these occupations and then we let them go into the wilderness. So we let them 
slow tree, and uh, they enter higher institutions and get into the pores of the corporates, sly corporates and treacherous ones that, that hook them and grab them all together. Ours is a free program, and we invest into re-equipping schools, and all the education of ours was online, and the teaser of my intervention was about uh, learning and teaching those who, ha who are in straightened circumstances. And uh, definitely we teach in those regions where our corporation operates. But uh, anyway, the groups of our company are active in all the regions of Russian Federation. So are we. But we mostly focus on small towns and villages, and we overhaul them, refurbish them, and re-equip them. And uh, over the five, five, five past years, most of the big corporates started similar projects, One C and Yandex and others, and uh, after the coronavirus outbreak, we figured probably was enough to start renewing schools and we should do something better, something more. And having MTS on board, we thought that an educational platform would be a good thing for us to do. And all that Jeff has said correlates and resonates with what we have been after. It's going to be an end-to-end -end platform that will probably be converted into the corporate university and those corporate universities since 1995 have been quite okay feeling well up and about and uh, in corporate universities or offline sessions are held quite random like the the premises of the Berban corporate university is mostly empty no one goes there off, offline and we will educate adolescents starting from 15 and 16 years of age and uh, we just figured that if uh, a corporation would not look into the education courses and process we would get the graduates that don't have any relevant skills and practical experience apart from those that have been grabbed by the evil corporates at the outset at an early stage and uh, the rest go to corporates after they graduate and they have to be retrained afterwards and we just fit in the education process at early stages to avoid that and Jeff said they have eight universities in the Russian Federation where five times ahead of them in this parameter to have 40 universities including the lovely and wonderful host of uh, our forum, uh, all these are partners of our, of our corporate university. Look at what our constituency is. If people want to study or take a course in the university, they may opt for probably an online, remote form of education. And the, the options on the table are were given in the slide, but we want to, to, to have something of our own. We took a snapshot of our employees of different ages, and as a matter of fact, we decided to, to launch the online project in August. It's a fresh. And we told students from St. Petersburg University that we had around 50, 50 seats and uh, carried out the selection procedure. We received 950 applications and half of, of the employees didn't finish filling in their questionnaires, their, their forms, and had several selection rounds and uh, ended up with 50 people at the end of the day. Well, probably most of them were from Moscow and Moscow region, but anyway, it wouldn't matter much. And we asked them, what would you like to learn? What shall we teach you? And here we could see the difference 
between what the high uh, and top managers want. They want the soft skills, how to pursue mentorship and other things. And we have around 150,000 employees on payroll, but uh, some, some part of, uh, of our minor junior positions want to become colors. Billet presses. And uh, you know, some of the people say that my my my, my profession has been replaced by the AI, so I want to learn something new. I, I will not tell you much more about these uh, wishes and needs or thereof, but let me tell you, we had an, a school, an, an on and offline school, and apart from the Python software programming language, we made 40 clips about mobile communications, about packing goods in the children's world store about how how electricity is generated we have a, a, a power plant on board in Bashkiria so we do something similar to what Kusera does we would not peg a, a an adolescent born in Stavropolsky region to his own region she, so he shouldn't be confined to gathering apples and picking picking fruit he probably would want to move to another region and opt for and opt for a furniture manufacturing plant. And now we are living in the post-pandemic world. Probably we'll be switching online, migrating online. But if we fully migrate online, well, ma many employees at the outset, uh, employers at the outset, said that you know I will make people redundant. Others will be transferred to the remote mode. But they didn't work out well, and as soon as the lockdown was lifted, they they moved back to offices. And and here we are in agreement with Lucera. We see it eye to eye. There will be a hybrid approach of online and offline um, education. So we provide out of the box solutions, telling people what. Uh, professions are relevant and where they can study those professions. And we have a third level of corporates. It is uh, only one month old. It's a brand new project and our corporate students could move horizontally and move up the ladder also. For that, we established a tool. Uh, I'm nearing the end. So we have, we have established the mentorship institution and our employees may opt for becoming a mentor. And the career center Vertical axis, which is an orange color, is about all that. And we want our students to opt for their future professions instead of going to McDonald's in the summer holidays. And we want our employees to be moving horizontally and vertically. This is why we have the career center, the professions marketplace. You can work, you could study online. You can take an online course and uh, we have, we'll be rebranding our platform. So far it's going to be free of charge, so uh, just join in. But probably in future we'll have more paid content. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I want to tell all the future speakers we could definitely talk about education indefinitely, but please be confined to five or six minutes, no more. But what AFK Sistema has been doing merits respect. And uh, definitely we marvel at that. And although it gives rise to lots of questions whether the choices made are right if you want to become a hull, but what if you change your mind and want to become a diplomat instead? And what about the, what about the public funds? And probably we'll come back to that at the end of the session. And now I'd like to invite Paul Zinkovich, who is the vice president of Prosvetchenia Publishing House. We studied his course books. 
written by him, and uh, now with this tilt towards an online form of education, I, I wonder how can you design an online an online uh, course book? What will be done for that? Thank you, thank you, dear colleagues. Thank you for the chance to intervene. And I'm proud that my alma mater has been raising this important topic of online and offline education. I listened with pleasure to Jeff's intervention and Oksana's one, but once I, I'm given the floor, I'll tell you a few things about the school education. Because it, is, it has some peculiarities with respect to the deployment of online technology, the specificity of the, of the school education is about being quite cautious with reforms and changes. Higher education is more flexible and mobile because would, oh, but in school education we may lose a whole generation if we make a mistake and uh, be in my capacity as Deputy Minister I said that and now I read to rate in my current capacity and uh, we do all the stages of school education have been watching closely the changes and we are an active participant of those changes and the remote education I must say is characterized by a number of positive changes and assets it is about providing equal access to different learners from the huge and vast territory of our country, which is a patchwork, and uh, that is beneficial for both pupils and teachers that can exchange best practices online. And definitely it is also about individual approaches and customized approaches to, to individual children or being quite particular to some children that trail in some of the subjects. And uh, definitely we also have a chance to provide access to the best practices and best course books and manuals. But at the same time, thank you for holding this conference right now. We could uh, take interim, intermediate stock of the isolation lockdown mode of the quarantine because of the pandemic and uh, the the abrupt switch to the online education in this country, as well as worldwide, proved several interesting points. On the, on the one hand, we have several studies at hand by the High School of Economics and Ran Higgs, Ranipa and others. And uh, we find out that international studies and research exercises show that children and pupils fall short of obtaining 10 to 30 percent of knowledge they should have obtained. But now we are moving to the online mode and the intramural uh, form of, of, uh, of teaching sometimes it's ruled out, but, you know, it is kind of force majeure mode, and many of the stakeholders proved to not to be prepared for that, and we launched several platforms, I mean the publishing house, and we launched several manuals, and we put all the manuals online, and uh, together with Ross Telecom, uh, Ross Telecom and Sperbank, we forged platforms and uh, around one-fifth of pupils started using our, our platforms and we transferred all our material to other colleagues and partners of ours. We launched copy digital course books and copy books with uh, AKM and uh, the A these were AI-driven courses and platforms. 
AI enabled ones. We, but speaking about school, we should not be oblivious that school is a place to teach some skills and competences to pupils. Schools is also about socializing and upbringing. In our country, the parents had the apprehension that the second wave may come to the fore and there will be resurgence. But what about socializing and what about bringing children up in school? And the upbringing component is quite, quite pronounced, quite considerable. In, uh, in our school education system, we are teaching and bringing up new nationals and citizens of our country. So probably offline, uh, the online format can hardly supersede the, the physical intramural presence. And although online mode has lots of advantages and assets, and maybe complementary to the traditional, conventional form of education. It may be enriching, it definitely should be expanded. You were right in asking your question. Like our group of company, companies producing content, it's not about paper books. It is about delivering content. And our colleagues from the school education ministry and uh, Education supervision service, they have set us a goal, being in charge of the content and supervising the content to provide for the necessary minimum of information, it should be a single core. And with the plethora of online platforms available and uh, being in line with the governmental and state standard of school education, we should be able to we should be able to guarantee the authenticity of that standard, the conformity of the standard, and all, all the courses on, on an online platform should also be in conformity with, uh, with the state educational standard, and uh, we should definitely appease the parents and make them tranquil that their children be able to take and pass the unified state exams in future. In our, in our system of supervising and overseeing the paper and uh, digital content is time-tested, and but still probably we should uh, make additional steps to provide expertise for the online content, and we should definitely be able to provide reviews of that. And Mr. Kondakov is present here at this round table. And he used to be leading and heading the publishing house, and our publishing house is one of the oldest in the world, and we are enjoying the legacy of the Soviet era. And definitely we see to it that all the content we have online and uh, on paperbacks be in strict conformity with educational standards and the final requirements of the uh, state exams so that neither teachers nor children or their parents should doubt that the content is not in line with uh, the standards. So 
we say to it and, we're, and we, ta we tell them rest assured it is in, in conformity with the standard and uh, unfortunately I'm time strapped so if you have any questions I'll, I'll, I'll take them. Thank you Pavel, we'll have been lagging behind uh, and we have the limited timeline so I would ask all people to, to, to stick to the timelines. And as Pavel has said about the fourth uh, quarter of last uh, school year, probably this, they managed to cope with that uh, emergency situation, but probably there is, there is no consensus in the society that we could switch fully to online, and the online format should super, can be able, can supersede the, the offline. And uh, now we will be able to listen to our French. Speaker. Bonjour, bonjour à tous. Merci, uh, merci de votre invitation. Je suis très heureuse de Very good partager day. Avec Thank you for the invitation. I'm so glad that I am able to share with you the, the perspective of Sian Spor. It has been a shock for us, says Benedict Duan. And uh, we will be, I think I, I shall be able to share some of the, some of uh, our expertise that we have accumulated over the past several months. We have 14,000 students and half of them are from abroad. We have applied many solutions that are ahead of the curve. And uh, we have been proposing different tools and with respect to the teaching community, we came up with a toolkit, and this students received access to computers as well as the teachers, and to some extent, the teachers sometimes would not accept those new technologies they wanted to oust the computer as a teaching medium. They wanted to get rid of the digital tools in order to come back to this direct relationship with the student. students. When the COVID crisis broke out, we, had, we, we were plunged in this new reality within a week. We had to migrate online and uh, on the 23rd of April we had to migrate online and uh, 100,000 classes were held on Zoom and by and large we, we delivered 800,000 teaching hours remotely over the past trimester. That was a challenge for our system. And uh, I must say that the, the professors, the, the the faculty were the hardest hit group of all, among all, and uh, we had no time to waste. And as a result, we resorted to the competence and education institutes. 
within CNS pool, and we have been able to provide our faculty with the necessary toolkit. At the end of the day, we asked our students what they could tell, and we wanted their feedback. So we noted the curious thing, which is that that it, people found it hard to interact remotely, as just overnight everybody was stripped of their social lives and uh, extra curriculum activities, which of life has changed dramatically. And uh, we had to work in this new context, and we opted for the hybrid option. In this sense, we unveiled a new solution for this hybrid online come offline curriculum. Some part, some part of the classes were delivered online, but this term will have remote classes and uh, online classes. A, an interesting undertaking for the science pool that has a bearing on the, the international students of ours is that we have been able to connect special class from and uh, you may get connected online and listen to a lecture. We have campuses in France that have this capacity. So with respect to the distant education, this was how we organized the process. So it is a hybrid approach. As I said, my final point would be about the hybrid model, and we figured it may be the most sustainable for future use. And uh, what we want is to maintain the, the, the quality standard of teaching. With the help of different tools, and uh, you can debate on many things. Nedict, can you hear me? It is necessary to provide all the access, equal access, and equitable access for all the actors. With, uh, the social interaction is also important. It must be borne in mind. We should. Uh, organize such get-togethers and the hybrid model in this case is an asset and uh, all the extra curriculum things must be must be maintained and the third one is the assessment a university must teach and then check knowledge so how all the Revolution can be pursued. In assessment can be pursued, and then comes then comes the issue about mutual trust between students and teachers and the data security and the, the confidence of students about the freedom of speech. All, all that is part of the. The new hybrid system, students obtain national exposures, I mean the internships, and practicing abroad, and 
and Alors, train your ships. Le, le très, très, très so for science sport is important. It constitutes one of, the, one of our basic principles. And, uh, I have now told you how we have gone through that difficult streak, and I would single out three lessons. The, third, the first thing is that we, are, we have proved able to move to the hybrid model. I'll move online. And uh, we have been able to determine the, the risks and uh, the challenges. And we have kind of been able to cope with those risks to manage them. Third lesson that we have learned is that the hybrid mode would be the best way out for us to provide for the continuous and secure contact between all the participants and stakeholders in the process, and that is our intention in future. Unfortunately, there are some time issues. Thank you very much for your speech. Unfortunately, we just constrain, have time constraints. Thank you very much. A very interesting presentation. Now, I'd like to ask Alexander Kandakov to take the floor, Director General of Mobile e Education. The input of which is difficult to overestimate. I'd like to listen to his opinion on the current requirements and demands on the digitalization process in education. So please take the floor. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in front of you today. I'm going to refer to my pre to previous presentations as well. Uh, I'd like to start with stating that the pandemic situation and the education system found itself absolutely changed our mindset and perception of different things, of how people get education today, what it is in its essence, we're talking about the upbringing, we're talking about the, the educating people, educating children. But as of today, we need to speak about the continued the personal development over the whole course of life. And this is the major peculiarity which is being shaping, which is shaping today. The point is that even without noticing that, but we shifted to a new society where now activities simultaneously or step by step are conver is convergent to the reality, to the real world or the virtual reality, in which we found ourselves in absolutely new normal. The foundation of that is the fifth technological wave, internet, big data, a huge speed of computing, decision making, and it shaped a new multidimensional environment for education development, which is developing very rapidly, expanding and outreaching to millions of people, even billions of people. Here we can see teachers, tutors who think of how education should look like today. What are new challenges in information revolution can we see today, which have drastically changed our relations? First of all, information activity has become the key element in the economy, the accumulation, retention, sharing, communication, and generation of new information. If we get back a little bit, we will understand that the change to any of the elements provoked civilization shifts in the development of humanity. And it's clear that in the situation we found ourselves, the activity of a person changed and the person's role in the economy. But it is all connected with the fact that we first of all need to teach a person to create and generate new information. And this sets a new set of requirements for a training of a person. I'm ahead of methodological uh, development in digital economy at the federal project of Russia. I have to talk to the leading IT companies. And this shift shaped a new set of requirements 
for a personal individuality, set of skills, motivation for knowledge, intellectual activity, the cultural development of a person, which are becoming the key milestones in person's development and human capital. Not the knowledge itself defines, but the set of skills. Not that I know, but I can. This is the key point. So we imply different capital in this respect. The major capital of any state is the human capital, set of skills, knowledge, competences, the level of emotional and social intelligence, the set of values, social and life priorities, spiritual development, psychological and mental health of a person within the professional activity. This is a drastic shift from the knowledge to set of competences and skills. And we see the changing role of, of the teacher. I unfortunately don't have time to speak about that. In fact, what I have called, this is the human life. And this is beyond the traditional educational terrain, beyond the textbooks which are outdated. It is beyond the traditional cooperation between the teacher and the student. In April, we saw how the interaction a change from vertical approach to the horizontal approach. And today we see a huge controversy between the demands and requirements of the digital education and the current system of education. Today's school was created following the requirements of post-industrial society, and information development has expanded but hasn't changed the quality. Today the traditional school is the key obstacle, the major obstacle to shaping new social and economic interaction. This is not a bad or good thing, this is just a fact. Any new economic development requires a new system of education. Undoubtedly, within the digital economy, we're entering into the controversy against the major key cornerstones of a traditional school to teach everyone, to teach uh, everything to everyone in the same way. Do you feel how it contradicts our reality? The digital economy has changed the priorities of education, not the transfer of uh, knowledge, but shaping the competences. This is the main foundation of a human cap capital for the future. Shaping the competences is not just a separate subject at school. We can see it from solving very complicated tasks, uh, R&D activity, interdisciplinary approach, the constant exchange of information, finding new solutions to new tasks within the constant uh, changes and complications. Under these circumstances, the state, the business and the academic society, this academic community are in front of a new task to shape single interdisciplinary system to provide for heritage to be passed on to other generations. This is the problem of many countries. But today we see a person absolutely a different angle, and we are talking about the education from very early childhood to the very elderly state. As of today, general education and professional education don't have the logic and continued shaping of competences. The federal standards, the federal requirements, educational standards, educational programs are developed and unfortunately do not correlate among themselves in terms of results. At the level of professional education, there are different absolutely controversial models. I believe that the CEO of Coursera can say that and can prove that. These models and the list of competences do not follow the real requirements of the digital economy. They are sometimes replaced by knowledge, by information, but this is not the way we should move in, into the future. So this is the task set within the program of uh, digital economy and the system of education, which should 
meet the demand in the basic model. This can be seen as a new methodology of a new education system development, which would allow to work with homogeneous sources of information, to have data-centered work, including the competences of all those participants. We need to look at the corporate standards and the corporate development, and not only to provide for uh, vertical but the horizontal mobility of the population, the updating of uh, professional standards and shaping the single system, developing customized education, catering to the demands of a particular person, and to shape a single dynamic ideological system which would underlie the education itself. We need to move within the education from transferring the knowledge to the shaping competences as a part of the personal development uh, lifelong. This is the methodological foundation of digital uh, education platform development, mobile education which we are developing, and other platforms which we can see in Russia as of today. And now they are of interest not only for the Russian academic, academic community, but for the global one as well. Thank you very much for your input. I'll urge you to focus on the major points. We, from my perspective, very new approach that we need to change everything. And before that, we saw that we need to be very careful about changes. And it's high time to listen to the practitioners, of, to Marina, for example of how in your corporation you have attitude to retraining of your specialists. Good day to everyone. Preparing, preparing for my presentation, I wanted to talk about the digitalization, about the industry, how the education allows us to transform under these circumstances. But all the previous presentations have a bit reversed me into a different direction. In this respect, I would like to draw your attention to the following fact. to draw your attention to underline the major ideas of our previous speakers that young specialists with competences required on the labor market are in low number and former students or fresh graduates have more theoretical nature of their knowledge rather than practical. And this is the point I'd like to uh, highlight uh, from corporate sector, particularly. A couple of words about my company. The source stance is the developer, technological company of developer software. Uh, we are a very uh, science-intensive business. We try to harmonize and utilize best practices, the best knowledge, the art of technology and science. And this is the synergy which leads to the harmonized development of the world, harmonized development of new generations. Listening to our previous speakers, you know this slogan, the immune system of the uh, world economy cut my attention, cut my eye. The students, the younger generation, and generations uh, moving in a row, this is not the foundation only of our economy, but this is the immune system of which students we are going to have in the future, how they're going to adapt to the real situations, how they 
going to be flexible, what competences they have, how they can demonstrate their skills, how comfortable they feel in this constantly changing environment. This is the major, major ability of youngsters, which would help them to move forward and to survive in this drastically changing world. Our company has more than 20,000 employees. We have representative offices in all the countries. We have a huge R&D center in 2018. Based on an analytics of Forbes magazine, our company was proved to be the most sustainable. One of the features of our company, that's all systems, one of the key strategic elements is long-term cooperation with the educational facilities, educational with higher schools. Being a technological company, it is very important to see the level of competences among our employees, among young specialists who start their career in uh, high-tech companies. And these uh, high-tech companies are going to be our clients in the future, and they're going to be uh, the driver of all different types of progress. I cannot, unfortunately, handle this clicker. If you can assist me, I will be very grateful to you. I'd like to highlight that, talking about the high-tech companies, over the last 30 years, our company has gone through four technological waves. We were a pioneering company in 3D projecting and modeling to the development of philosophy and understanding of how the product life cycle should be managed. And today, our driver and the major impetus is the development of a uh, digital twin of a human. As I've mentioned already, being a high-tech company, we're interested in what is happening in the education sector, whom we're going to see as our future employees, how youngsters work with technologies. We have a huge area. Working where we work with the academic community, and we conduct research on into which competences, which skills, and which future further occupations will be in demand in five to ten years. It's not a top secret that being a high-tech company, we need to talk about the engineering skills. Right now, at the production facility, a specialist takes about three to four years to get hold of all these skills, to be a very efficient employee. So our task is to foresee the development of competences, skills in different occupations and how they will be changing. So leaving and graduating from university, working for the corporate, a young specialist should be a huge asset and to be involved in the process as much as possible. Here we have the approach, so-called oriented, task-oriented education. We are working with a huge industrial businesses which give their own tasks. They set their tasks based on the current work or which should be tackled in the future. So th with the help of our software, the students find solutions. Through that experience, they get these practical skills, practical competences, and which is happening within the course of the education. This is not a theoretical, this is a 
theoretical part. The person leaves the university and he has a huge portfolio of different solutions to the tasks in robotics, in additive technologies, in virtual digital twins, and I can solve tasks like that and this. So our academic programs are based on this principle. Our approach to education is the development of expertise centers, center of competences by industrial companies and higher schools when the corporate or the business can set the tasks and the institute or the academy based on our technologies can train their own students for them to find solutions so we see the synergy effect between the academic society and business society so we are very interested in the development both of technologies and in intellectual skills among the youngsters. Here you can see the centers around the world, not based on the campus of one higher institute. It might have the support of huge industrial uh, corporations, that's what we did in the United States together with VGT University. This is a huge uh, aerospace center. Now we are working on the development on centers of machine building centers on industrial engineering and shipbuilding in Russia. So they can, together with us, based on our technologies, uh, have students with the competences required on the market in the future and today. So graduating from your alma mater, you can start your career just straight away. And in brief, what our program can bring, and the major point is to be closer to science, to industry, and to create long-term partnerships and the centers of expertise with our partners to train and prepare the engineers of the futures, those who can have those skills and competences which will be required when they start their career. That's it. I do hope that I was within my time. We have the, our online speaker. This is the representative of Bright Think Academy, the United Kingdom Chief Executive Officer, Robert Mitten. Hello, Robert. Thank you for having me. Um, so, Bright Think Academy, we work with universities here in the UK to help train people to be more vocationally competent. So one of the key challenges that we have and what we were trying to face is how when students leave university, they are coming out with the acad academic skills, but not the vocation. So what I think Academy aims to do is one solution to this is to have a online academy that can be parallel to the degree. Now, whilst a student they're going to be learning the theories of management. What Writing Academy our online learners, coaches, assessors, is then get them to implement the theories that they learn from their degree. Uh, one of the things that, for example, Business document, uh, the type of document that you present to your CEO in a real And this is helping to solve problems uh, in the pipeline with employment. More recently, we started doing this. And with the marketing students with Brighting Academy, we actually deliver the vocational of 
and we put it together in one portfolio. which they can put into their CVs before they've even started their work. They're already coming out marketing. And then on top of that, they've already got the work experience. We found this to be really positive and have great reviews on university all the way, all the way through. I think, you know, when we start, Learners were unsure because you know the courses are 100% online. Uh, we were able to use our own in house developers to create the application each seven hours a day. Uh, we built a really strong personal relationship with the learners. Now, our university. don't have the relevant qualifications, Bright Think Academy will put them through the relevant put them through access to hardware, you know, to that telephone. Process is the connectivity. Um, not everyone a, has a difference geographically. We have on in the island, the, you know, the so we really understand learners' behaviors, um, their connectivity, and make our content suitable for everyone. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert, do you hear me? I'm, I'm awfully sorry, but we have some problems with, uh, with the noise, so is it possible? Okay. All right. I'm not sure. Okay. Maybe it's the translation on the computer. Now I would like to, first of all, to thank you uh, for a very interesting speech. But uh, so uh, we, we did understand, let's say, the crucial idea about the importance of um, uh, distance uh, uh, educations, and uh, um, if if you don't mind, so we'd like to, to to go on with our other participants of the discussion. And thank you very much. And it was very very kind uh, from your part to take to agree to to participate in in uh, our round table. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Uh, and we have one speaker uh, online, Radek Spitzer, the Vice President of the Confederation of Industry of the Czech Republic, who is going uh, to speak on behalf of business. Uh, good afternoon. Who is going to elaborate on how this questions connected with the changes to education system in Czech Republic are being solved, including the interest of the businesses. The guards from Prague to Moscow. Yeah. I understand you perfectly. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> but I will switch into English if possible. That's great. Thank you. Excellent. You mentioned one of my positions, which is uh, vice president of the Confederation of Industry, uh, which means that I'm basically representing companies vis-a-vis -vis the labor unions and the government in the Czech Republic. But I also acquired a new position last week, which is deputy chairman of the National Accreditation Office for Higher Education. 
I didn't get it because of your conference, but it comes useful. Yeah, thank you. First of all, thanks for the invitation. I really appreciate it. It was extremely interesting for me to hear uh, other speakers speaking about their experience when it comes to alternative methods of teaching, online courses, and uh, post-pandemic situation and uh, in the world of academia. I'm aware that uh, the time is flying, so I'll be very quick, I promise. I have just a couple of remarks uh, based on our experience in the Czech Republic uh, in the last couple of months. First of all, speaking on behalf of Czech businesses, but uh, at the same time, on behalf of Czech universities and academic institutions, I have to say that uh, the both worlds, the business world here in Central Europe and the academic world here in Central Europe are very conservative. They have always been but the COVID pandemic will change it and is already changing. I'll give you two specific examples. In the world of business, home working was known, but was not very widely used. This is now changing dramatically and uh, employers must have get used to the fact that they will be working with their colleagues without seeing them in their offices. And the same applies to academia. Online courses, online teaching, these alternative methods of uh, teaching were known, but universities were not using them very often, I have to say. That is now changing. We were forced to change our conservative behavior, both business and in academia. What we found out that it will not be easy uh, to adapt uh, to the new environment. Why? First of all, we found out that schools are not ready. Schools were closed in the Czech Republic, universities, public schools, private schools for two months. Some schools made it, those who were equipped with uh, modern technologies, uh, schools with uh, younger uh, professor staff, but uh, many schools struggled. They didn't have uh, online technologies. Some schools had it, but didn't have teachers able to use it, etc. So there will be a big task for the whole public educational system to deal with on the side of uh, educational institutions. Secondly, it uh, turned out that for a lot of families, uh, this was a big problem because they were forced to go online overnight. And uh, unfortunately, many families didn't have uh, two laptops and they had two children who were you know, schooled online. So the academic situation of Czech families suddenly became an issue. And for single mothers, for example, single fathers, this was a huge problem. They found themselves in a very difficult uh, social situation, uh, unable to pay for additional notebooks, uh, Wi-Fi connection, etc. So another big deal for the government and for the whole country, uh, because we have to be able to face it better way next time. Third uh, lesson learned, uh, new big task for accreditation uh, offices, like the one uh, I'll be representing in the next, uh, next six years. We have to come up with new guidelines for universities. We will have to be uh, ready for data protection, uh, personal data security transfers, online testing, uh, quality assurance of courses, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Big task uh, for all of these uh, institutions across the European Union, I would say. But to conclude, uh, we will do it. Uh, we are not ready yet, but we will have to. 
get ready and be ready and foresee all these challenges. And if there are two things that we hope uh, this new environment will bring and will change, that we will, we will encourage better and more intensive cooperation be between public and private sector, between, for example, private businesses and universities, which is uh, a cornerstone, uh, a fundament of the competitiveness of the most developed Western countries. And unfortunately, this cooperation has been not uh, very successful in Central Europe in the last couple of years. So that will have to change. And secondly, we hope that it will internationalize our academia. Because uh, I'm always jealous when I hear about uh, Sciences Po and uh, Ivy League universities in the United States saying that uh, half of their uh, student body comes from abroad. In our case, it's uh, much more limited, it's 10%, 15%, and I think that's a big handicap uh, for us. Uh, it needs to be changed, and I think that uh, alternative uh, ways of teaching, online courses, online teaching uh, will, enable us, will enable us to increase uh, the level of internationalization of Czech Republic. Uh, Thank that's you. all, thanks a lot. Thank you, Moskva Dikuvi. And uh, as a way to conclude, when we are moving towards the conclusion of the session, and the technical support today has demonstrated the main issue. The digital technology bears lots of promise on the one hand, but on the other hand, uh, this implementation the level of implementation of the digital technology is not yet perfect and may be fraught with lots of issues and problems in education and we are not fully prepared to embrace all the digital technology that we have at hand and i was uh, marveled to learn about the possibility of uh, a digital twin of a person and you know but when my prompter says into the ear that uh, Vitaly three minutes to go two minutes for the speaker I, I, I was slow at, at reacting and responding because what is essential and valuable is the eyeball to eyeball communication between people so that via interaction, direct interaction, we will be able, would be able to resolve issues and problems and reach new heights. I congratulate you on the conclusion of the round table and uh, here we discussed the main issues, the main problems and points on the agenda as the school education ministry and I represent that ministry, I sit on, on the board there. It is a, the, a ministry of the future, and all our achievements depend on how efficiently we teach our students and pupils and children. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for condescension. Thank you.